It's really good that we sung that song just now. Because what I've got to say, you won't find easy to hear unless you have sung that song and you can go along with it. We're going to be reading a story in the Old Testament later, so if you want to find a Bible, a church Bible, then we'll then please do. But the theme today comes from a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. It's going to be up on the screen, but if you want to read it in your own Bibles, then do. Church Bibles is on page 1,200. It comes in the context of relationships, but it affects everything. And it is. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. And this phrase, you are not your own, you are bought with a price, rings and resonates through me and has been working its way through me. Many of us, most of us perhaps, are believers in Jesus and Christians and became a Christian perhaps many years ago. Now, when you became a Christian, did you invite Jesus into your heart? Did you surrender your life to him? I wonder how it was put to you, what you were doing. But when we become a Christian, what we're doing is a life swap. We give our life to him and say, it's as if I died. Romans chapter 6 says, I died with Christ. I was crucified with Christ. I no longer live. That's Galatians 2, actually 20. And instead, we get the fantastic gift of him living in us by his Holy Spirit. We are not our own anymore. We've been bought with a price. We've been given a new identity. We've been given a new reason to live. If you ever come across anybody who doesn't want to live anymore, you can say to them, that's fine, because I know somebody who wants you to live and who wants to give himself to you so that he can live through you. All he needs is your body and your choices and your decisions. And we sung about serving, but it's not about serving God primarily. John chapter 12, there's a verse in there which says, those who serve me must follow me. We can look it up if you like, John chapter 12. Check that. John chapter 12. And uh, in the church Bible, it's 1132. And it's John chapter 12, verse 23. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a grain of seed, wheat, falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And this next verse, Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. Do you know it's possible to try and serve the Lord without following him? Do you know people who do that? They want to serve the Lord, but they don't follow his leading. That's why it's so important what Richard was talking about a couple of weeks ago, um, about 
listening to God. Because if we aren't familiar and confident in following those Holy Spirit nudges and following the word that he gives us, well, we might be trying to serve him, but we're not following him. And if we're going to follow him, it's going to cost us everything. Because it costs Jesus everything, and he is our example. And he lives his life through us. That means that we don't get to choose what church we go to, folks. If you want to follow him, you go to the church he sends you to. What happens if they've got, they haven't got a youth group? They haven't got this? They just teach that aspect of theology, not quite as we like it, we think is right. If God sends you there, you follow, you go. You lay down your desires, your wishes, your thoughts about how it ought to be, and you say, I surrender. I follow, choose to follow the leading of your Holy Spirit. Maybe you don't want to go to church. Maybe you're cheesed off with church being not as it should be. Well, fine. Okay. But what's the Lord say? to you you're not your own you were bought with the price he calls you to go into situations and to live in situations all the time which are not perfect but he calls us to be salt and light wherever we go and to follow him wherever we are we have to honour him with all that we do you're not your own, you were bought with a price. So there's that person you don't want to forgive. Tough. You've got to forgive them. You don't want to forgive yourself. You're always on it yourself. That voice in the back of your head condemning you, criticising yourself. Tough. Jesus says, you're forgiven. I've given you cleanness, righteousness of Christ. Now, get on with it. Get up again. Get up. Stop going on at yourself. Get moving again. I've got a job for you to do. There's many examples where, for you, the Holy Spirit will be telling you now, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. You've been thinking you had a choice in the matter, but you don't have a choice if you want to follow me. You do what I say. And uh, the mums group... Um, and we've been doing this wonderful Bible study course called Be Blessed. And it talks about how God really wants to bless us. And so following him, it's not like, oh, I've got to do this thing. It's like, oh God, I, I don't understand, but okay. And what do you want to shower upon me? What do you want to use me to shower upon others? To bless them, to bless the body by being obedient to you in, on this thing. And perhaps the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now about a thing where you thought you had a choice. But he's saying, if you want to follow me, you do what I say. And I will pour out the blessings of heaven on you. I will abundantly bless you and I will make you a blessing. Don't wait for things to be all right before you're all right. We can be okay in the midst of not okay. And in fact, God calls us to spread his okay to the world. And I want to show you from a story in the Old Testament how one man took this idea that he wasn't his own, he, was, he laid down his life, he knew the covenants. Again, this course that we're doing with the mums is really big on covenants and how God has made a covenant with his people and we, he keeps his side of the covenant always. And as we walk in that, we are blessed. And we are a blessing. So let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 14, actually. 1 Samuel chapter 14, which is on page 335 in the Church Bibles. Now, just to put this in context, we are 
in the time of the kings, the first king, King Saul, the first king of Israel. Israel was living as a people group in the land and they had been ruled for some time by the judges who were leaders that God put in place temporarily to help Israel out of difficult situations. But eventually Israel asked for a king. He gave them Saul. But Saul was one of those who was not following and obeying. And they got into a situation where Saul was, um, they, they, Israel was being attacked and Saul, he'd had 2,000 men with him and his son Jonathan had had 1,000 men with him and Saul's army were getting scared because the, the enemy was attacking or going to attack, they were sort of camped over there and, and um, Saul's men were so scared that they started deserting. And they got down to 600. And if we look in chapter 13, verse 15, uh, we'll read from there. <coughs> now, I happen to think that some other people might like to read some of this. Not me. So, would... Uh, anybody like to volunteer to read because otherwise I'm going to pick somebody I think Kevin would do this really well Kevin have you got a bible okay So, Kevin, could you read um, from 15, chapter 13, verse 15, to the end of the chapter, please? Chapter 1 Samuel 13, verse 15, to the end of the chapter. 15? Chapter 13, verse 15. Right, I'm with you, right, okay. Then Samuel left. in the vicinity of Shaul, Shual, another towards the Beth Horon, and a third towards the borderland overlooking the valley of Zehoyim, Zeboyim, facing the desert. Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel, because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. <laughs> so all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plowshares, mattocks, axes, and sickles sharpened, and their chainsaws. The price was two-thirds of a shekel for sharpening plowshares and mattocks and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes and for repointing goads. So on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul or Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. And lots of deserters. So, what's God going to do? So, he's going to send somebody. The whole of Israel represented by the army there with Saul. Many deserters. Things not in good state. God is going to send somebody. Just one person. And who else would like to read a bit? Hey! Great. So if you could read from where Kevin stopped and let's go to um, well how about to the end of 14 now a detachment of Philistines had gone out to the pass of Michmash one day Jonathan son of Saul said to the young man bearing his armor Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. 
Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With him were about 600 men, among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod. He was a son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitob, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes and the other Sene. One cliff stood to the north towards Michmash, the other to the south towards Geba. Jonathan said to his young armour bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armour bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, Come then, we will cross over toward the men and let them see us. If they say to us, Wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armour bearer, Come up to us, we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armour bearer, Climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up, using his hands and feet, with his armour bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan, and his armour bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armour bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. Thank you. Uh, Just to that? Uh, Let's read 15 as well. Then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and field, and those in the outposts and raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Saul's lookouts at Gibeah of Benjamin saw the army melting away in all directions, and then Saul musters the rest of the army, and he went into the battle, They found the Philistines in total confusion, striking each other with their swords. Uh, Verse 21, those Hebrews who had previously been with the Philistines and had gone up with them to their camp went over to the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. When all the Israelites had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were on the run, they joined the battle in hot pursuit. So the Lord rescued Israel that day and the battle moved on beyond Beth Haven. So, how does that relate to this? It seems to me that it only, to use the phrase, it only takes a spark to get the fire going. It only takes one Jonathan who is willing to honour God with his body. That verse said, you are not your own, you are bought with a price, therefore honour God with your body. Jonathan was willing to honour God with his body. He was so convinced by the covenant relationship with God that he was willing to go out there and he said, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. He didn't know for certain, but he says perhaps he will, because he's the kind of God I believe in. He's the kind of God who keeps his covenant with his people. And I know the stories, he would have said to himself, I know the stories of how he rescued Israel way back. Perhaps he will do it today. Now, Tissery has been uh, spoken to by the Lord about starting Living Waters, and I want to just talk to Tissery about that. So, Tissery, if you could come up, please, with the microphone. just want to talk to you about that. Because Tissery is one woman, and yet she has a big vision. And God used Jonathan, one man, to do something that meant all the rest of the army came in alongside and they got a huge victory. So Tessery, I'd just like to 
you to tell us about how you got the vision for doing li Living Waters and just the story of it, please. Yeah, first of all, I want to say, um, and you all know there are four elders. So we all get together every Monday and then we pray for the church. So at what one point um, when we were praying, um, even before this, God showed me a vision um, that people are coming to this church. So I prayed over that um, quite um, regularly about this vision, what I saw. And then I've um, got told, I mean, also I want to, to share, when I'm looking at our church, I'm seeing that we are doing so many things or activities for us, for the church, for people who are coming here, groups and prayers and everything. But I didn't see that we are doing many or at least something for the community. I didn't see that. So that kept on in my heart. And then how God was, Jesus was saying to his disciples, go and go out and disciple. Disciple all the nations. So before, even before you disciple someone, you need to go and preach the good news. And then I'm listening that there are many, many bad news that we are hearing. But as the church, what is our cause or what is our calling? How do we preach the good news? Because people are there, out there, they are desperate. They, they, their hearts are broken and they need some help, support. So this is how this came to me because I quite, I prayed about it and then how, this is how this came to my heart. And then I did share that with our elders and with their agreement, we decided to go for this. And as I've mentioned earlier, then I've asked from the Lord, Lord, what do I call this? So again, this living waters, um, the, the name came and then I thought, yes, living and then waters. We could quench the thirst. Can we quench the thirst with all other drinks? It's the, that's the water that we need. And anyway, it's biblical. So then I've asked from the Lord, Lord, give me, give me a version, give me a Bible scripture to confirm this. And that's where Zechariah 14, 8 came. And then it, it is saying that the, from, the, from Jerusalem, it is flowing to the eastern sea and to the western sea. And what season? In all summer and in winter. So this is how this all of these came. And also I had this mind how jo, um, jo, um, Joshua went with two people to conquer the, the, the promised land. The, all the uh, eight people said no, but two said God is saying that. And the, when, when God is in it, it will happen. So if God is not there, it will not happen. So this is how it all came. Thank you. Thank you, Tishri. <laughs> so, I'm sure I could have interviewed others amongst us with the same principle. God gave Tishri an idea, and like Jonathan shared it with the armour bearer, and then the armour bearer said, I'm with you. So the elders all said, we're with you, Tishri, let's do it. And then uh, we're right, the rest, of the, the, um, you know, the rest of the church can get behind that, and we'll see what God does. And it's a, it starts with a perhaps the Lord will act. And then, of course, it finishes with a fantastic outcome where there is victory. And we expect that. We expect salvation. We expect lonely people to be um, comforted and people to be drawn in to fellowship with God through this. So... That is in relation to white leaf. For me, I feel that um, I've, this summer has been quite tough and I don't know why because I, I kind of gave up. I thought, August, I'll set it apart. I'll have lots of time off. I'll really seek God. And in my head, I've just been battling and struggling. 
And when I see this passage, I think, but there is a bit of me which is a Jonathan. There might be a lot of me which is a Saul and the 600, but there's a bit of me which is a Jonathan and which is saying, no, I'm, I'm going to go for this. And as I get that bit of me that's standing up here talking to you today, all the rest of me is going to come behind and is coming with me because the Lord is the one who's the covenant maker and he is the one who's going to win the victory. And I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know as I go for it and go forward, as I stand up before you today, that, you know, the Lord is going to bring his word to us because I trust him. When we think about, for you, for us, our work, our families, wherever we have a sphere of influence, just be a Jonathan in that arena. Bring God's faith work to wherever you are. You'll, you'll have to work out what that is with God, but don't be a Saul, frightened, back, sitting in your camp, wondering what to do. Say, no, I'm a Jonathan, or there's a part of me that's a Jonathan, and I'm going to bring God's kingdom to my family. I'm going to bring God's kingdom to my workplace to my situation and in our country there aren't that many Christians compared to the whole population but why can't we be a Jonathan and see our communities and our country changed I think we can because we have a great God and we're going to put his word and his kingdom above our own lives I'm not my own we are not our own Whiteleaf Free Church we are not our own we are not free to do as we choose we are free to follow him and to be his source of light to our community and our country. Maybe some of us have lost heart, but I'm not my own. I'm not free to continue in that. Jesus laid down his life so that we can lay ours down in service of our country, in service of our family, in service wherever in following him and whatever he does. Okay, let's, let's pray and then we'll just leave a little bit of space to see what the Lord is saying to you. Father, I thank you for this message that I am not my own. We are not our own that we have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus, that we are not free except the freedom of serving you. And that is freedom indeed. Lord, we repent where we have taken it as if we had the choice in areas where you've been clear and we come back to you again. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Thank you for the rest of listening and being obedient. Lord, have your way in our lives. Your way, Yahweh. And Lord, we're here together, so we say your way at Whiteley Free Church and through Whiteley Free Church. Lord, we expect great victories like Jonathan and his armour bearer. And we expect others to follow as we lay down our lives and say again, we are not to our own, 
we were bought with a price. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for buying us back. Thank you for the price that you paid. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.